all attendees are in listen only mode. Good evening and welcome to Repro Action's monthly Act and Learn webinar. Our topic this evening is why are stores making emergency contraception hard to get? And this is your host, I'm Erin Matson. I'm one of the co-founders and co-directors of Repro Action and I'm based in Arlington, Virginia. And I'm Pamela Merritt, the other co-founder and co-director of Repro Action and I am based in St. Louis, Missouri. So the agenda for tonight is um, obviously we're going to introduce any new folks to ReproAction and who we are. Um, then we're, there's going to be an overview of emergency contribu uh, contraception, followed by a case study into Harris Teeter Creates Barriers. Um, next will be stories of barriers to accessing EC. And then we have a fantastic guest panelist, Kelly Cleland from the American Society for Emergency Contraception. And following that, we're going to go through action steps and next steps, and then we're going to have uh, plenty of time for Q&A. Throughout this process, if you have questions, please drop them into the question tab on your control panel. There should be a go to webinar control panel to the right of your screen, and uh, there's a tab for questions. Drop them in there, and I make, I'll make i make sure that I go through them um, at the appropriate time. The hashtag for live tweeting is don't hide plan B. So who the heck are we? Um, Repro Action is a new direct action group forming to increase access to abortion and advance reproductive justice. We are incredibly proud of our left flank analysis, our willingness to hold folks on all sides accountable, be they allies or opposition, and our commitment to nonviolent direct action. And next up, we're going to have uh, the wonderful Maria Peoples, who is on staff with Repro Action as a communications associate, and she's going to go over some emergency contraception. Thank you, Pamela. So we are going to be talking about the importance of access to emergency contraception tonight. So I just wanted to give a brief overview of what emergency contraception is. EC is birth control you can take to prevent a pregnancy from happening after you've already had sex. There are a variety of reasons folks may need to access emergency contraception, such as having unprotected sex, having a condom break, being the victim of an assault, or any other reason that somebody may need and want to prevent a pregnancy. Emergency contraception is most effective taken as soon as possible after unprotected sex and can be as effective up to five days after. This is one of the reasons that swift, easy access to the medication is so important. I know that I personally have had the experience of needing emergency contraception over a holiday weekend when doctors and clinics aren't open and I found myself scrambling to find a store that sells it before it's too late. Emergency contraception will not terminate an existing pregnancy, so it exists as a preventative measure to prevent a pregnancy from ever happening. How is emergency contraception accessed? In a few different ways. Um, so progestin-only emergency contraception is approved for on-the-shelf, unrestricted sale. This includes Plan B and some generic brands. You might find it in the family planning aisle or another section of the pharmacy. Retailers are allowed to put it directly on the shelf to purchase like you would purchase anything else in the store. There is still some confusion about this. So it's really important to note that people of any gender or age are allowed to purchase emergency contraception. You do not need to show an ID, tell the cashier how old you are, or present as a woman. You don't need to give any information about yourself or the per person you may be purchasing it for. In addition to purchasing it from pharmacies or grocery stores, many people also access emergency contraception from their doctor or healthcare clinic such as Planned Parenthood. All right, thank you so much, Maria. I'm gonna put you on mute for the moment um, and start talking a little bit about Harris Teeter. So Harris Teeter is a grocery and pharmacy chain in the mid-Atlantic that operates more than 230 stores in seven states and the District of Columbia. 
It is a subsidiary of Kroger, a larger chain that you may have heard of, which when I asked them about it, declined to tell me about their emergency contraception policy. Though I can say from personal experience that I've spotted it, uh, Plan B One Step and the generic My Way available for unrestricted sale on the shelves at Kroger stores. So it's pretty clear that Harris Teeter, which has a bad policy that needs to change, is not a Kroger parent company policy. And Harris Teeter is the problem. So let's talk a little bit about this. So what you see here on the screen is a picture that I took at Harris Teeter. So what they do, this is really funky and weird. They put a card on the shelf in the space where plan B should be. It's a box sized uh, area on the shelf. And it says to purchase this item, please take the pharmacy, take it to the pharmacy or to the customer service desk in non-pharmacy stores. This appears to be in direct contradiction to the spirit of the FDA regulations, which allow plan B one step and other similar emergency contraceptives to be sold on the shelf um, without having to go to a pharmacist. So I wrote a piece for Rewire about this, specifically diving into it. And I, you know, it's interesting when I first took a picture of that and put it on social media and just tagged Harris Teeter and asked why it was necessary, I got a response from their social media team and they claimed to me that um, the reason why they do this is because store managers and pharmacists are HIPAA certified and HIPAA is the Health Insurance Privacy and Portability Act, which by the way has nothing to do with uh, needing to buy emergency contraception over the counter. Um, but, and also, you know, theoretically that's about privacy, but it doesn't make it more private when you need to go speak to someone to buy a product on the shelf. Um, so based on that, I was intrigued and asked for someone I could speak to on the phone and spoke with the director of pharmacy at Harris Teeter and learned that, um, you know, that I asked him point blank, you know, what is Harris Teeter's policy on dispensing emergency contraception. And he said, well, we just follow the FDA regulations. And it was clear to me then that, you know, work needed to be done. So I spent um, a number of weeks following up. And at first I thought they might be willing to make a change. I tried to negotiate with them and that didn't work. So now we're moving forward um, to take more direct action targeting Harris Teeter. And you'll hear more about that later in the call. Um, but we as an organization are planning to do direct actions and picketing of the stores uh, of Harris Teeter stores in order to um, send them a message that we really would like to see emergency contraception on the shelf. And there's no excuse for doing this. Um, we also, um, as repro action under the hashtag don't plan hide B, don't hide plan B, excuse me, um, encouraged our followers and supporters to tweet at Harris Teeter and let them know that they need to fix this. Again, Harris Teeter um, has not taken action yet. And so as with any organizing campaign, we're planning to escalate this now into direct action. Um, so I just want to be very clear because sometimes people say they're like, well, wait a minute. Why does it matter? Like a card on the shelf. That's no big deal if you have to talk to a pharmacist. Well, actually, barriers to emergency contraception create real hardship for people. As Maria noted um, in, in her own personal story, it can be very difficult to find emergency contraception. And it shouldn't be that way. The Food and Drug Administration has made it clear that anyone should be able to purchase this product off the shelf without having to talk to anyone, without having to show ID. Um, and when EC is not on the shelf where it belongs, it can be hard to find. Um, for the article that I wrote for Rewire, I actually sent um, some people to go look for it and they went to multiple stores just having difficulty finding it. Um, two, it can be really embarrassing or shaming to have to talk to a pharmacist or manager. Oftentimes you have a possibility of getting a lecture or shaming. We also know that there's another huge issue with a number of pharmacies where there's pharmacists who refuse to dispense products and reproductive health care products in particular for personal reasons that, that they say are their morals. Um, and finally, there's widespread misinformation um, that still lingers. And we'll get into that more with our guest panelists. But you have a number of instances still of 
pharmacists and store clerks believing that they need to ask for an ID or telling men or people who present as men that they shouldn't buy the product. Um, because of barriers to EC, what it's hard to find, what it means is that people are unnecessarily delayed in getting a time-sensitive product. As Maria has covered, emergency contraception is most effective the earlier you take it, and it's an urgent product. This is It's an emergency, right? And so we really want to make clear that this is a big deal, and this isn't just quibbling. Um, and finally, I just want to be firm that keeping emergency contraception off the shelf for ridiculous reasons is patronizing and sexist. And in Harris Teeter's case in particular, the fact that they gave me self-contradicting answers that were also incorrect tells me that they, there's really no firm ground for them to stand on, and it's just time to do what their customers want, and that is to put the product on the shelf. Um, so with that, I'm going to pass it back to Maria to share some personal stories that people have shared about accessing emergency contraception. Thanks, Karen. Can everybody hear me? Yep. Cool. Cool. So there are a lot of stories out there from people who have needed to access emergency contraception in a timely manner and have struggled to do so. When I was talking with friends about this topic prior to the webinar, and when I was dialoguing with folks who were participating in our Twitter action directed at Harris Teeter, what I really commonly heard was that at the moment somebody needed to access emergency contraception, the last thing they needed was to face barriers or embarrassment when trying to access it. I wanted to share just a couple of stories from young women who have written about their experiences trying to buy Plan B as young people. The first story I want to share is from Leslie, who attempted to buy emergency contraception at her local Walgreens when she was 17. When she found where the box should be, it instead had a cardboard substitute that instructed her to speak with the pharmacist to purchase it, really similarly to what Erin experienced at Harris Teeter. She thought it was supposed to be available right on the shelf, so this confused her, but she followed those instructions. She said, I reluctantly headed over to the Walgreens pharmacy consultation area where I could talk to a pharmacist. I was intimidated by the prospect of having to talk to a stranger about emergency contraception. I politely asked the pharmacist if I could purchase Plan B one step. She directed me to check out, dismissing me as if I was already supposed to know where it was. The emergency contraception pill was available on the shelf behind the cashier next to nicotine patches and memory cards for cameras. Not only did Leslie have to talk to a stranger in order to access emergency contraception, which she had the legal right to buy, but she felt as though she was further disrespected by the pharmacist when she was trying to do so. She finished her story by writing, the search for emergency contraception had been like a scavenger hunt. After wandering from one aisle to the next, I concluded that buying emergency contraception over the counter wasn't as simple as it should be. Asking strangers if I could purchase Plan B one step had been terrifying. I had worried what they thought of me. Did they think I was irresponsible? Even though I know buying emergency contraception after the condom break or you forget to take the pill is the responsible thing to do, that doesn't mean I want to talk to a cashier about it. In a worse kind of scenario, Leslie's experience shows us that barriers to accessing emergency contraception can deter and even fully prevent somebody from purchasing it. The last thing store policy should lead to is for somebody to walk away without the product that they need. Um, as Erin had noted, that's a really serious issue. I want to share one more story, um, an experience from somebody named Grace, who was featured in a story about buying Plan B done by Teen Vogue. The story focused on the experiences specifically of young people needing Plan B, noting that the most common uses of contraception are in their early 20s. Grace was my age, she was 23. When she was feeling nervous and out of CVS after being told that she could find emergency contraception in the feminine care aisle. When she couldn't find it, she reluctantly asked the pharmacist for help. She was then told she had to speak with the cashier, an older man she had early, earlier been avoiding, and she didn't really feel comfortable asking him for emergency contraception. She said, I would heard it was supposed to be available right in the aisle, and I obviously didn't want to ask anybody, but it was just not anywhere. I have no idea why they make it impossible to find. She eventually got it from the register, but not without feeling frustrated and embarrassed. So many different people need emergency contraception, and there should be no shame in purchasing it. There's no reason anybody should have to talk about their private needs with a stranger in order to access them. Grace said, 
I know it shouldn't have to be embarrassing, but it feels awkward to be kind of broadcasting that you're buying something so personal. These stories of Leslie and Grace are just two of the stories um, that show the harm of making emergency contraception difficult to access by putting it in a lockbox, keeping it off of the shelf, or somehow otherwise requiring, requiring people to speak with an employee to find and purchase it. Leslie and Grace were eventually able to get what they need, but many others in their situation may feel too confused or too embarrassed to continue looking for emergency contraception after being put through so many hurdles. Um, so with those stories, I'm now going to turn things back over to Erin, who is going to introduce our guest panelists tonight. Thank you, Maria. That was fabulous. So now we're being joined by, and very excited and honored to be joined by Kelly Cleland, who is the Executive Director of the American Society for Emergency Contraception. She is also a researcher at Princeton University, and we're so honored that you're joining us tonight. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you so much, Erin. I am really excited to be talking with you all today. Um, and I just want to share with everybody that Erin just joined us at our annual meeting in D.C. Um, to talk about her experiences taking direct action against Harris Teeter. And we're really, really thrilled to be um, partnering with ReproAction. And I look forward to a long and fruitful working relationship. Um, so do you want me to just dive in or do you want to frame the discussion with your question? Um, I'm happy to ask uh, the questions, but Kelly, if there's something that you just want to say, I mean, you are the expert. We are so honored to have you tonight. Go for it. Take it away. Um, or I can ask that first question and we can move forward, whatever you prefer. Why don't you start with the questions and I think everything will sort of come out through those. Awesome. All right, let's do it. So my first question for you is, there have been many changes in the regulations around emergency contraception during the past 15 years or so. And I would love for our listeners, if you could explain what are the current regulations on emergency contraception? And then secondly, from the point of view of someone trying to get it, what should an ideal experience of accessing emergency contraception look like? Sure, so you know, as you and Maria both alluded to, the regulatory history of Plan B has been just incredibly confusing. And I would say you can characterize it uh, by, uh, you know, I think the history of it is very sordid. There's been a lot of political shenanigans around this. Um, this is a very safe drug that um, was first approved for OTC sale in 2006, if you were 18 and older. Three years later, it was approved for OTC sale for 17 and older. There was even a brief period for like three weeks in 2013 when it was approved for OTC sale for ages 15 and older. So like this thing has just evolved and changed very, very rapidly, um, completely out of step with its actual safety record, which is, you know, I think we all understand that Plan B is incredibly safe. Right now, all levonorgestrel EC products, whether they're the branded products, Plan B One Step, or the generics, can be sold on the shelf with no ID requirements to anybody of any age. Um, we, I, one of the things that has made this incredibly confusing in the last few years is that first the branded product, Plan B One Step, went OTC, and then the generics went OTC, but they still had this language on the package that said, it was recommended for use in women age 17 and older. It wasn't an actual restriction, but it was there to protect Teva's patent um, on Plan B One Step, and so that just made everybody incredibly confusing, um, made the situation confusing. Um, in terms of the ideal experience of buying EC, anybody should be able to just walk right into a store at any time of the day, I might add. It should not just have to be when the pharmacy is open. Um, they should be able to pick it up off the shelf, buy it through self-checkout, and have it paid for by insurance. Um, even better than that is having EC available in vending machines or 7-Eleven, any place that is accessible all the time. Um, I think the most important thing is that the, the purchase should be private, and any involvement that um, the customer has with a healthcare provider including a pharmacist, should be completely optional and up to the customer. If you have questions and concerns, you should be able to get help with it. Um, but this is really 
the ultimate DIY product, and no one should have to discuss it with anybody unless they choose to. Um, and the last thing I'll say about this that can complicates things a little more is that the FDA regulations allow EC to be sold OTC on the shelf, but they don't force the stores to sell it OTC. So it's kind of up to the stores how they sell it, and as we'll discuss more, um, that is very much a gray area. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I I just want to underline, you know, the fact that what you reported back to us, and thank you, is that the history, the regulatory history of emergency surrounding emergency contraception is confusing. It's confusing even for people who really care about it a lot, not just you know people pharmacists who may not uh, have this as their specific area of specialty, and so it's. It's on one hand, it's I think it almost seems easy to see that some people might just be purely confused because there's been so many changes over the regulations. Mm -hmm. At the same time, um, I'd just like to do one quick follow up question. How long has it been the case that um, that many common forms of emergency contraception can be sold on the shelf to everyone, regardless of age or gender? I just want to underline, for example, an organization like Harris Teeter. How far behind are they at this point? Yes, 2013. 2013 is when all forms of leave industrial EC were approved for sale on the shelf. So it's been, it's been three years. Um, there, is, there is no reason for anybody to be holding EC behind the counter or asking for ID. It's been, it's been three years. Yeah, that's, that's just ridiculous. Um, thank you for that. And um, so my next question for you is, why is access to emergency contraception important? And why does it matter when retailers make it hard to get? Yeah, that's a really important question. And, you know, I think you and Maria both talked about this. Um, but I'll just underline that, you know, EC is needed for such a wide variety of reasons. So, it, you know, we know that it's not the most effective form of contraception that somebody can use. But it's really, really important that people have access to it in situations when contraception fails, when contraception isn't available, and this really includes such situations of sexual assault and reproductive coercion. Um, women feel really vulnerable, I think, a lot of the time when they have unprotected sex and they don't want to get pregnant. Um, and unrestricted access is really important because the easier it is to get, the more likely you are to get it as soon as you need it. And as you mentioned, you see it more likely to be effective as soon as you take it. So, you know, I think the, con the conventional wisdom is that you have five days to take EC. But the reality is that it depends where you are in your cycle. So if you're very close to ovulating and you take EC, it's not going to work. So I, that's why we really recommend that women take EC the very, very soon as they can after they have unprotected sex. Um, but beyond the question of the urgency that's related to better effectiveness, um, it's just, you know, EC is a really important part of reproductive choice. Um, it should be your right to purchase it whenever you need it. And we hear a lot of cases of men being denied EC, of women being asked for ID, um, and of people being made to feel really embarrassed for buying EC. Um, I think the ID thing is really important. Um, when there was an age restriction on the sale of EC, everybody had to show ID. So that meant no matter how old you were, you had to show a government ID. And we know that there are a lot of reasons that people don't have ID, including immigration status. Um, so this practice is really discriminatory on many levels. Um, and I think, you know, it's important to keep in mind when people feel anxious and vulnerable in the face of the possibility of a pregnancy that they don't want, it's really easy to feel intimidated. And I think this might be especially true for someone who is young or who routinely faces discrimination, anybody who feels disempowered and nervous in that situation. So, you know, I think EC should be easily accessible right away for anybody who needs it any time. Thank you. Yes, I mean, I think it's, it's clear for a number of people who have use this product when talking about it. Well, yeah, I was really stressed out trying to get my hands on it. I think we all have stories and know people who shared stories with us who are trying urgently to get their hands on it. And discrimination against people is quite possible when there are unnecessary barriers. So thank you 
for that. And um, my last question for you is your organization, the American Society for Emergency Contraception, has led research on retailer practices regarding emergency contraception. And what are some of the trends you've seen in terms of retailers putting EC on the shelf? Yeah, so uh, part of our mission at ASEC is tracking these trends in access to EC. Um, we've done surveys every year or two for the last few years to see what's really happening out there on the ground. And what we find is a really, really mixed bag in terms of availability. So our last survey, which we did last year, included 220 stores from 23 states. Um, about two-thirds of those did have EC on the shelf in some form. This is up from about 50% in 2014, so it's a little bit better. Um, but even though EC is on the shelf, it doesn't necessarily mean that you can just grab it and go. Um, we found that in a majority of stores that stock EC on the shelf, customers still had to interact with the store personnel to get to complete their purchase. So in 90 of these stores, EC was in one of those big plastic boxes that you had to carry to the front to get on rocks. Um, and then in 12 of the stores, it was in a fixed case, and so it had like the button that you have to press, and the store staff will come over to the aisle and un unlock EC for you. Um, and that just really defeats the purpose of the OTC status, of the that on-the-shelf status. You can't just pick it up, grab it, and go and complete that purchase without talking to somebody. You have to, you know, go up to the whoever is at the counter who may or may not be somebody that you feel comfortable interacting with around your EC purchase and get them to help you with it. Um, a couple of other issues that I want to highlight that we found. Um, we had, a, for 159 stores, people went to the pharmacy counter to ask some more questions about how EC is sold in that store. And one of the things we asked people to find out is whether there was an age restriction that's enforced at that store. And 40% of people were told that there's an age restriction on the sale of EC. So this hasn't been true for three years. Um, what was really interesting to us is that there wasn't agreement about what, what the actual age limit is. So we heard some people say that, that the age limit is 13. We heard some say that the age limit is 18. A handful of people said that there's an age restriction, but they weren't sure exactly what the age restriction was. Um, I don't know how you would enforce that. And actually, I mean, it's, it's really interesting for that brief period of time when we had this age restriction of 15. There's no way to check that because 15-year-olds generally don't have a government-issued ID. Um, so, you know, we've just found this really wide range of misinformation and confusion. Um, some of the answers, we just didn't know where they came from, um, but they certainly were not helpful to the women who were trying to purchase UC. The one piece of good news that I'll say is that in 95% of the stores, our mystery shoppers were correctly told that men can buy EC. So that's a good, that's a good thing. We do still get complaints um, at ASEC. We ask people to let us know when they have trouble buying EC. And we still get complaints from men saying they were denied or from women saying that their male partners were denied EC. Um, but at least in our survey, most stores seem to know that men could purchase it. Um, Something I want to highlight is something that Erin really touched on, and that's the variation even within the same chain. Um, so we had four chains that had a decent amount of data, and we looked at whether the stocking practices were consistent across stores, and they are not. Um, so both of when we looked at stocking practices, meaning whether EC is actually on the shelf, and the ID and age restriction policies, um, there was a really wide amount of variation within the same chain. We found that um, Rite Aid was the most consistent. Um, all of their, most of the stores that had EC on the shelf, um, it was, that was a good thing that they had it on the shelf, but most of them had it in a plastic box. But all the other stores, really, really a lot of variation. And you know, so what this tells me is either there aren't concrete policies at the corporate level, or there are policies at the corporate level, but they're ignored by the individual pharmacy managers, or perhaps they're just not communicated very well. Um, and you know, when I talk to folks on the pharmacy side about why EC isn't on the shelf, the people, you know, a lot of people just don't know about the current regulations, so that's a huge problem in itself. 
Um, among those who do know of the current regulations that they, you know, who, who do know that they're allowed to sell EC on the shelf, the reason they don't is because of the price. Mm. Um, it really hasn't changed. Um, much recently at all, I had this dream that when the generic went OTC, there was going to be a price war and all these market forces were going to, you know, introduce competition. That did not happen at all. So if you go into a pharmacy, you'll see Plan B One Step, which is fifty dollars, and then you'll usually see one generic product, which is forty dollars, and often that generic product is made by the same company that makes the branded product. Um, so there is really no competition here in this market. Um, one good thing that I found out recently is that there is a, there's a two-pack being sold um, in Rite Aid. So you can go in and you could, there's a My Way box that has two doses of EC. So in, that's $60, so it's $30 each. It's a little bit cheaper. Um, it's good for if you uh, want to plan in advance and just have EC available, share it with a friend. Um, if you're overweight and worried that EC will be less effective for you because of that, because there's some research showing that that's the case. If you're on you enzyme-inducing drugs, you might want to take a double dose. So that's, a, that's a, a place where there's a little bit of innovation in this market that's been very, very stale, and we might start to see some price pressure. Um, Something that I think is really funny is, you know, these stores say that they don't put EC on the shelf because of the price, but when I go to my CVS and I see the empty EC shelves, right next to it is a $70 vibrator. And I'm thrilled that CVS is selling vibrators. Very sex positive. It's fantastic. But that's more expensive than the $40 generic EC. So I think there's a lot of other things going on as well. Um, we, you know, we see the price as a really consistent uh, and significant problem. There's a movement towards insurance coverage of OTC EC. Um, Maryland just covered, just passed a law that will require insurance companies to, to cover OTC emergency contraception. Um, but this is a really important barrier. It will continue to be an important barrier, um, and it's a it's a tough one for us to change. So this is a place where I think the private sector um, really has to step in. Um, but I'm, uh, you know, I'd like to, I don't know if we can talk about this a little bit more at the end, but I really want to invite everybody to join the ASEC list because it's a place where we share information about um, new things that are happening with EC. Um, we share information about our annual meeting, and we've got some other resources available that, you know, I'd like to make sure everybody knows about. Yeah, Kelly, feel free to feel free to share that information right now. And if you have, I'm happy to also chat out to everyone in the group if there's uh, certain web links that you want people to know um, or your list right. and how to do it. So feel free to go right now. Oh, great. Okay, good. So the best way to join a list is just to email me directly. Um, my email is K Cleland K C L E L A N D at princeton.edu, and Erin, maybe you can send that out. Um, and I would love to add you, and I can sh give you a couple of links um, to our pharmacy guide and to our reports and some other um, stuff that we have available on our website. But we would love to have everybody, you know, kind of join us. And I really love hearing what you all are working on and sort of keep, keep the energy moving because we need to – attack this problem from as many different directions as we can. And I am really interested in trying to, uh, you know, get involved, like talk to the folks at the corporate level and get their policies, um, make sure, educate them and make sure they know what's going on and help you get their policies up to speed. Um, but I think there's a lot of work to be done and there are a lot of approaches that are really, really important here. Yeah, Kelly, I, I really appreciate that, especially I think it's probably becoming clear to our audience that you have, that you come at this issue from a, a very many angles. And um, it's great to hear the appreciation for direct action's role in helping to move things forward as well. I just want to lift up a couple things because I know I touched on Harris Teeter before and Repro Action as an organization, I want to be clear that we are committed 
um, to having emergency contraception on the shelf, wherever it is sold, no funny business required. The reason why we're targeting Harris Teeter right now is we have a very clear confirmation because I have spoken to him um, that this is a corporate policy problem. Um, and I know this because mm -hmm. I spoke with the director of pharmacy who gave me some of the confusing and self-contradicting answers after the social media team had given me other confusing and self-contradictory answers. And so it was very clear to me at the time that this is, you know, this is something that Maria is about to walk us through in terms of what to do if you see something funny um, at your local store regarding access to emergency contraception. But with Harris Teeter in particular, I mean, just like you were saying at CVS, you see $70 vibrators on the shelf. At Harris Teeter, they're selling vibrators on the shelf as well. Um, they're much smaller. They're the Trojan brand. But again, I mean, it's the fact is they're selling other products that are uh, much more expensive. Um, it's clearly not that. And I think what this all boils down to, and it's I think it's the reason why I was given so many different answers and not one clear answer, is because this is rooted in people's yucky feelings about sex. And in particular, that there's um, there's a tendency in our society to view pregnancy as a punishment um, and something that women or people who become pregnant do to themselves, right? And that if you have sex, you need to um, you need to pay for it. And I'm not saying that's what happened, that somebody wrote that into their company policy. But when you have people struggling to articulate why they're doing something that is clearly patronizing, um, it's suspect that, that old ideas are being held on to. So um, I just, again, thank you, everyone. Please feel free to type in questions for Kelly in the chat box, and we'll get to as many of them as we can at the end. Um, Kelly, I'd love to move on to Maria now, if you're comfortable with that. And if you have more, then yeah. you're also welcome to share. Great. Um, so let's pass it back to Maria. Yeah. yeah. Um, thank you so much, Erin. And thank you, Kelly, for all of that information. It was super helpful. Um, I want to talk a little bit about things that we all could do as we move forward on continuing to act on this issue. Um, and I want to provide resources, and like Erin was saying, Refer Action really wants to provide support for everyone to be able to address issues of emergency contraception access in their own communities. Um, we believe we can be proactive in making sure that our local stores and pharmacies carry emergency contraception on the shelf without barriers. Um, and do so by showing our, our widespread support for this access. Um, and we know that everybody here um, can be part of this organizing work. So for starters, as Erin mentioned, keep a lookout and join us in the coming months as we continue our efforts to ask Harris Teeter to change their policy. We've already communicated with the chain and spoken out on Twitter, but we definitely aren't done yet and we want to see this through. So if you're interested in taking part in direct action around this issue, please let us know. Um, we will definitely have more to come on Harris Teeter um, going forward. Um, and most importantly, though, um, you can start by making a difference on this issue by holding your local pharmacies and stores accountable for keeping emergency contraception directly on the shelf. Um, we've created a one-sheet, step-by-step guide for taking action against barriers to emergency contraception, which I'm going to go over here, and that we'll also email out and make available for all webinar participants once we're done. Um, I think this will be a great tool that people can feel free to share with others um, and to raise awareness about the importance of keeping emergency contraception on the shelf. So, the next thing you're at your local store, here's the guide we created to take action. Um, if you notice that emergency contraception is being kept in a lockbox behind the counter or is hidden in some other way that requires shoppers to jump through unnecessary hoops to purchase it, or maybe you can't find it at all, you can look to this. So um, it lists out the different barriers that you may see and reiterates that emergency contraception should be sold on the shelf without restrictions. You don't need to show an ID or otherwise prove your age to buy it. If you notice it's being hidden in some ways, you can start by taking a picture of what the store is doing with EC for reference. And then you can contact us for support. We'll be here to help you with materials, talking points, and more. 
we then suggest contacting corporate headquarters. So it's usually not um, the individual store or a pharmacist within the store who's making this decision, but your local store is likely following policy from above. So it's important to contact the decision maker. Like Erin said, she talked to the head of pharmacy at Harris Teeter. So look online for a customer services contact and ask who you can speak with regarding a pharmacy concern. We even have a draft email we can provide you to send up the ladder. And then after you've spoken with somebody, make plans to follow up. Um, what we found is that folks will often say, oh, yes, we'll look into that or, you know, we'll see what we can change. Um, but unless there's pressure, it's unlikely for that to happen. So after speaking with corporate, let them know that you look forward to hearing how they are going to change their policy. And then you can continue working with us to either escalate or take next steps to make sure that that happens. And um, those next steps can look like a lot of things. If a store refuses to consider changing their policy, you can organize an action. Options include a protest, a letter writing campaign, Twitter campaign, things like that. Um, if you see something, say something. And finally, um, there's contact information included to contact our awesome organizer. Kebe will be helping folks organize for emergency contraception access around the country. Thank you, Maria. That was awesome. And um, and by the way, thank you to Maria for putting this webinar together. It's It's been spectacular. I'm very excited. Um, so I just want to highlight, as I do on every webinar, that we want to make sure that you're plugged into all of our Repro Action campaigns. We've got an amazing accountability, show me RJ, show me reproductive justice accountability campaign going in Missouri right now. We've got a Who is Closing Abortion Clinics campaign going right now. And as um, is being made clear by this webinar, we're in the process of building an emergency contraception access campaign right now, too. We don't want you to miss anything. Um, we also have a ton of fun stuff and, um, and uh, rapid response alerts and things that you can take action on. So please sign up for alerts so you don't miss a thing at www.reproaction.org, just up in the upper right-hand corner. Um, that's how you can join our email list. And please follow us on Twitter and Facebook where we are ReproAction. Also, um, in addition to Kelly's email address, which I chatted out earlier, we encourage you to check out the American Society for Emergency Contraception at americansocietyforec.org for more information specifically about emergency contraception. Um, and also, we'd like to ask you to save the date. We do these webinars uh, once a month. We use them to connect activists together, to share strategies about what's working, what's not, to dive deeper into topics, um, and educate ourselves. Next month is going to be a very special webinar. I don't know about you all, but this election has been exhausting, and we are going to have a more informal chat um, with post-election support for reproductive justice advocates so we can all unpack just what the heck happened um, over these past months. So we hope you'll join us. Please mark that on your calendar, Tuesday, November 15th at 7 p.m. ET. And if you are join our email list, you'll be sure to get the invite to that. Um, and so with that, I'm going to pass it back to Pamela, who's going to go through questions that we've gotten. Thank you Thank so you. much. So here we go. We've got lots of awesome questions. The first question um, is from Katie, and it's a question that I actually had jotted down while Kelly was talking. Um, so it's the same. We're brilliant minds think alike, right? Um, so the question is, in the context of abortion access, what is the significance of difficulty to accessing EC? Um. Can you explain the question a little bit more? Sure. So um, I can't I can't speak for Katie, but the way I was thinking about it is I'm based in St. Louis, Missouri, and um, we have you know one abortion provider for the entire state, and there's limited access, um, and, and it's a very geographic um, burden for people. So the importance in my mind of having EC available um, without shame and without hurdles is that you know this is a, another tool and option that that uh, people who can experience pregnancy might access to prevent pregnancy. 
Yeah. Oh, yeah. And that's it's such an important point. Um, and, you know, it's interesting because a lot of the settings in which it's difficult to get an abortion, it's also difficult to get EC. Um, we see that a lot with Zika virus in, in those settings where Zika is really heavily transmitted, you can't get an abortion, EC is also heavily regulated and restricted and unavailable. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I think the more the more things that we can do to put this directly in women's hands, I think, you know, the more important it is. I mean, I, one thing I want to emphasize is that, you know, I think in the early days of EC, we had this dream that it was going to be the silver bullet, right? It was going to be the thing that reduced pregnancy rates, that um, reduced abortion rates, that, like, it was going to solve all of our problems. And it really has not turned out to be that at a population level, at a public health level, um, partly because it's not as effective as other methods, partly because women don't take it every single time that they're at risk. Um, I think, you know, because EC is so expensive, women need, need to make a decision every time they have unprotected sex about whether this is the active unprotected sex that is worth the 50 bucks, you know, you have to make this calculation. How at risk do I think I am? Um, but I think, you know, for even though we don't, we haven't found that it is going to reduce our abortion rates by 50%, which is, I think, what people had originally hoped, it's still incredibly important for individual women. Um, and I am so thrilled that there is, you know, a renewed focus on EC and because it is really the ultimate DIY, as I said before, women can get this on their own. You can you can decide when you need it. It's safe for everybody with a very, very, very few exceptions. Um, and, you know, I think it's it's a like kind of the ultimate reproductive justice self-care, except for the fact that it's so freaking expensive. <laughs> so true. So true. Thank you so much for that answer. Um, so we have another question from Marlo. And this is, um, could you speak more to taking two pills for people with higher BMIs and what is the effectiveness? Sure, yeah, so this has been a very hot topic in the last few years. Um, another place where EC is incredibly confusing, um, a couple of years ago a study came out showing that EC is less effective for women at higher BMI um, and actually there was a point at which it stopped being effective. It, it was completely ineffective. A couple years ago, the European Medicines Agency, which is like the FDA of Europe, actually changed the label for levonorgestrel EC to say that it doesn't work if you weigh 165 pounds or more. If you think about that, that's kind of amazing because the average woman in the U.S. weighs 166 pounds. They, they actually reversed that decision because they really, after they looked more at the evidence, they realized the evidence really isn't that clear. The FDA did not change the label in the U.S. because they also felt that the evidence wasn't that clear. But there's still, there's ongoing research to try to figure this out, right? Because it's incredibly important. So many women are at that weight limit where if it's not effective, it's not effective for half of the women in the United States. So while we're trying to figure this out, um, and all of the smart biomedical researchers who, you know, hopefully have a little bit of money to study this stuff are, you know, there are folks working on it. In the meantime, you know, I think the best recommendation for women who are at that 165 or, or over weight level, I think, you know, the, the most effective thing is to use a copper IUD, which you can get inserted by, uh, you know, after sex, and then it's good for 12 years. Obviously, a lot of women don't want an IUD for a lot of good reasons. Um, for if you don't want an IUD, it's probably best to call a clinic or your doctor and get the other kind of EC pill available in the U.S., which is Ella, which has been shown to be more effective for higher weight limits. Um, but there is a, a new study showed that for women in the higher BMI categories, it might it might be as effective to take two Plan B one steps as you know that you might get the same kind of efficacy. 
but there's a lot of questions about it. We're, we're not sure. The good news is that there's physically no downside. I mean, you might have a little bit more nausea. It's totally safe. There's no concerns about safety. Um, it's just going to cost you more money. Got it. Thank you. That was all such great information. Um, so before I continue with questions, if you do have a question, please feel free to drop it in. This webinar has uh, 10 more minutes, and we're going to try to get through as many as possible. So moving on to the next question, has ASIC found, and this is from Kevin, has ASIC found that pharmacists in states with conscience clause laws um, allow a pharmacist to refuse to dispense emergency contraception are effectively refusing to dispense it. To dispense it. So have you been tracking that you or know, do you have any information about that? We don't have, you know, we had 220 data points from 23 different states. Unfortunately, that's not enough to really tease out something like that. Um, if we were going to try to study that, we'd have to really design our, our research to to target states with, con where, with conscience clauses. What's interesting is that I don't know how conscience clauses apply to OTC products. Mm. So, you know, if you think about, you know, there's, there's a history in the U.S. In, in certain states of pharmacists being able to say, I don't believe in birth control and I'm not going to dispense it to you, um, but that's a prescription product. Can they also tell you? I don't think your cold is bad enough, and I don't want you to buy Sudafed. I don't know if they're allowed to do that, so I think there are different limits. However, I think, you know, as Erin was saying, I think a lot of this movement, um, a lot of this refusal to put EC on the shelf is one giant conscience clause. You know, it's about controlling women's sexuality. It's about feeling that um, women need to be punished, women need to pay for all of that, Sex that they're having. Um, so whether it's explicit or not, it, it reads as a conscience clause to me. And the FDA can't make them put it on the shelf. So we have to make them put it on the shelf. Got it. Thank you. Um, another question from Marlo. Um, I always understood that Plan B, Next Choice, E Contra were good for only three days, not five according to their websites, they say 72 hours. Is the five-day efficacy a sort of off-the-books use? Is the five-day efficacy similar to Ella? Is Ella moving towards OTC? Oh, that's a lot of good questions. So the five days, so first of all, just as background, the reason we care about five days and only five days is because that's how long sperm can live in the body. So after five days, Sperm are dead, so like you're not going to get pregnant, so it doesn't matter. You're either pregnant or not after five days, and it it doesn't matter anymore. There have been studies of of um, levonorgestrel EC up, you know, up to five days. Generally, it shows less effectiveness every day, um, and that's I think because the sooner you take it after sex, the more likely you are. To catch yourself right in the right part of your cycle, um, Ella is generally more effective than Plan B. No matter where you are, or no matter you know, kind of it, where you are in your cycle, because it works a little bit closer to ovulation, and that's kind of the, the really critical point: is that 24 hours before ovulation, Plan B stops working at a certain point. Ella can work after the I don't want to get too much into the weeds, but Ella can work closer to the time of ovulation, which is kind of the, the key time that we really care about. Um, in terms of Ella going OTC, it's OTC in Europe. Um, I would love to see it OTC here. I think there's a lot of support for it. I think the anti-abortion movement in this country, as we know, is incredibly powerful. Um, I think they're is a lot of willful mislabeling of Ella because it's an anti-progestin like mifepristone. It's in the, in the same very general category of drugs as mifepristone, the abortion pill. And so I think a lot of people like to confuse um, Ella with, with an abortifacient. Um, so I think because of that, 
it's, it's more challenging. There's some new research showing that it really doesn't work after ovulation has occurred, which would mean it really can't work as an abortive patient. But we need more research like that to really make the case. Um, I hope it's going to be OTC. It would make a lot of things better for a lot of people because it's better drugs. Okay. Got it. Thank you so much. So that actually is a perfect segue into the next question. So, um, so it, it's um, and I actually think this is a helpful question. Um, this actually comes up all the time. So what? And this is for like the press, who often I'm sure you've seen this far more than I have. But where you'll see the press uh, confuse Plan B with the abortion pill. So if you could just kind of explain the difference, and I know you've covered it, um, you cycled through it a couple of times, but just um, clearly the difference between Plan B and the abortion pill. Yeah, so I mean, the main thing is, I mean, and I think the research is pretty clear on Plan B. It does not work once ovulation has happened. And in fact, it doesn't work even when, when ovulation is about to happen. So, you know, they've done studies where women came in um, after unprotected sex, they looked exactly at where they are in their cycle and blood work. For women who were past a certain point who were about to ovulate or who had ovulated, it, Plan B did nothing. The so pregnancy rates were exactly what you would expect um, without the use of EC. For women who hadn't ovulated yet, there was a significant reduction in the pregnancy rate. So once, I think the research is really, really clear for Plan B. Once ovulation has happened, the barn, the horse is out of the barn. And, you know, once that egg is released, if there are sperm there waiting, hanging out for five days, Plan B isn't going to do anything. Um, the evidence is good. I think, it's, I think what's hard about EC is that it's really counterintuitive for people to understand that you can take something after sex and that it's not an abortion. Um, just because it, it I, we, we always think you have to do something before you have sex or while you have sex. Mm -hmm. But I think it's just hard for people to get their minds around this, but scientifically, I think we're really, really comfortable saying that it does not work after ovulation. Got it. And if anybody has specific questions about that, I'd be really happy to share research and resources about that. That's awesome, and thank you so much. Um, so we will definitely, um, we, we are going to circulate a recording of this webinar um, probably tomorrow, and, uh, and so that information will be available. Um, so thank you so much. We're coming to an end, um, but I, I definitely think those resources are needed, and particularly for people who work on these issues. Um, with folks who might just be confused or um, the reality is a lot of people are confused about um, how pregnancy works <laughs> so it's always helpful to give people information from an accurate and factual source. Um, Kelly Cleland thank you so much this has been fantastic and such an informative webinar um, I want to say thank you to Maria for um, taking a lead and pulling this all together, and of course to my co-director, Erin. Um, if you want to find out more information, and I sincerely hope you do, about ReproAction, please check us out at ReproAction.org. We are also, as Erin said, ReproAction on Facebook and ReproAction on Twitter. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining. We're ending just a couple of minutes early, um, but this has been a fantastic webinar, so thank you to all of our attendees as well.